Uh, been several weeks since we <clears throat> looked at, Math- uh, at Malachi chapter 2, but uh, I've gone through several lessons there. Malachi 1, where they ask, Malachi 1 and verse 2, well, in what way have you loved us? And then the prophet Malachi reminds them, you've not honored God. And they ask, well, in what way have we not honored you? And so they, they have questions. And for the most part, the kind questions are, are good, except the people who are asking them were not really looking for an answer. You've probably heard a, a question that was more of a, a deflector, a shield, a self, matter of self-defense, than really looking for the answer. And that was the case there. And the last time we looked at Malachi, we looked in Malachi chapter 2, where God told Israel that they were dishonoring Him by putting their spouses away. And so that's where one of the more well-known verses in the book of Malachi where God says, I hate divorce, for it covers one's garment uh, with violence. That's where that comes from. And so following that lesson a few weeks ago, we looked at, at God's law, God's teachings on the subject of marriage, that one way that they had dishonored God was by ignoring His instructions. And so, of course, the opposite is true. How, how do we honor God? Uh, we worship Him in spirit and truth. That's a part of it. But the, the overall conduct of our life, God looks at our lives as a whole. And so we looked at God's law on marriage in an effort to honor Him. And if God's law on marriage is one means of honoring Him, then the same is true when we look at His law regarding divorce and remarriage. It's the far less pleasant uh, you know, part of, of honoring God and of this relationship. But Jesus chose to spoke on it. And so tonight, uh, we're going to look just at three passages. Matthew 5, Matthew 19, 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, This is going to be pretty much the only chart that that I'll use uh, to outline our study. We're just going to go verse by verse through a few of these sections uh, to to teach us or to just remind us of God's law in this area, uh, especially because it's such a great contrast, uh, significant contrast, with the, the, the view of our world and how man views these relationships. So we'll start where Taylor, from, uh, where Taylor read in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 31, among the other things that, that Jesus talks about, the tongue and, and your enemies and love your enemy uh, and vows and, and anger, among all of these things. In verses 31 and 32, he talks about divorce. And he begins... Uh, in verse 31, dealing with the subject that I, I suppose was as common then as it is today. Uh, man hasn't changed so much, and I don't know how different our society is from the society of that time. You had Jewish society, but you also had the Roman society. Uh, very luxurious, very much in love with, with their own pleasures and their own desires. So I don't know that there's as much difference as we might perceive there to be sometimes. And we'll see in Matthew chapter 19, uh, the, the subject of divorce arose when they, in Matthew 19, when they asked Jesus a question. Here, uh, Jesus just says, here's what you've heard. It, it, it's been said, but now notice in verse 32, the first word of verse 32 is, but, and think about how that's, that's an attention getter. Every translation, I looked at several uh, every translation I looked at started verse 32 with, with that single word, but. So think of, of how that would draw attention as the people are listening. He says, well, you've heard it said, but. Think about how that, how that would affect you. If I was here saying, well, since I've lived here, I've learned that, that y'all say, but. That, that says we're turning a corner here, making a U-turn. Or more so, what if I said, as Jesus does in some passages in this section, well, you've heard it said in the Bible, but I say to you, you would not expect those words to come out of my mouth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. But that's not the way we think about teaching and instruction. That's not the flow of thought. That's what Jesus does here. But I say to you, so Jesus isn't giving, giving commentary. Well, here's what you've heard, and here's what I think about that. He just says, it's been said, but I say to you. And what, what credibility? We, we know Jesus as the one who taught and died and arose and, and His glory. He sits at the Father's right hand. That, that's how we view Him. At this time, though, 
What, what did people think uh, of him? What were his credentials? In the, at the end of Matthew chapter 4, we see that Jesus, beginning in verse 23, he went throughout Galilee. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, he was doing all, uh, healing all kinds of sicknesses and diseases among the people. His frame went, uh, fame went throughout Syria. Great multitudes followed him in verse 25 from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, beyond the Jordan. Uh, Luke mentions in Luke chapter 6, which is the parallel account of Matthew 5, that from Tyre and Sidon they came. So people came from all over and they saw Jesus do the miracles that He did. And so primarily by that. Now He's, he's shown His right. He's established His authority to be able to say, I say to you, and for, for that to mean something, that He had already gained their attention in that way. And so I say to you, whoever divorces his wife. We, we read this being distant from the audience of that time and the people and the circumstances of that time. But make, make it personal, make it real, think about. Uh, first of all, did, did Jesus care about these people? Did He care what they thought? He did. Why else would He have been teaching them? And then did, did they know of His genuine concern for Him? Well, he had just he had been spending time healing them. Imagine there are people listening to him who had had maybe sicknesses for some significant amount of time or a short amount of time, but some serious illness, and he had had healed them. Would would that not also add to his uh, his credibility or just their genuine aware their awareness of his genuine concern? So Jesus has already established his genuine concern in their souls. Uh, for every one of them, did he know that there were pe- there were people that I would assume in this large of a gathering as we're listening to Jesus, people who had had been involved in divorce, maybe their parents, grandparents, maybe their their own spouse. Uh, I believe Jesus, assuming there were, Jesus knew that, or maybe there were people presently, maybe even considering that. If there were, would Jesus have known that? He would have known all that was had and was going on. And yet Jesus didn't avoid this painful subject. And what He was going to say might bring some painful memories from the past. It wouldn't erase that, but it would help. What He was going to say was going to help them. At least it was going to help all of those back to the beginning of chapter 5. What kind of of people was Jesus appealing to them to be? What kind of people would be benefited by some some of the painful statements of Jesus? Well, someone who's poor in spirit. They they can hear the hard, harsh, even that they might be considered things of Jesus and accept them. People who mourn. People who are, are, are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Those who are meek and so on. And so Jesus was especially speaking for their benefit, but of course hoping to help all. And so he makes this broad statement, whoever divorces his wife. Uh, let's just briefly be reminded of what, what, even, what is divorce? In our society, I remember growing up and there was a show kind of like Judge Judy, but it was called Divorce Court. I don't even remember if I watched it or not. just remember it being, being in, uh, uh, on the daily routine. And so the idea that, well, divorce, that's something you go to a court and you ask a judge for permission. But that, that's actually a, maybe a legal definition of it. But did you know Jesus practiced this word? Over in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 23, it's translated different, but it's exactly the same word. In Matthew 14 verse 23, crowds had come to Him on another occasion, and He sent them away. And that's all that the word divorce, whether Greek or English, whatever, that's all its most basic meaning. That's all it is, to send away. So Jesus sent the multitudes away. He didn't have to go to a court and get a certificate to send the people away. Their relationship, of course, was different. Context defines everything. But that's the basic meaning of divorce, to go away or to send away. In fact, I typically use the New King James, and it's not very often that I say, well, 
look at the King James Version on that. But in this case, I think the King James Version translates it just more simply. In Matthew 5 and verse 32, whoever puts away his spouse. It's just a very simple translation of an expression of what divorce really is. Because again, often we hear divorce and we think, oh, that means you've got to have a lawyer and then there's a waiting period and you've got to file the paperwork. Well, I'm not saying that could be totally ignored, but a man who tells his wife, I'm leaving, and he takes his bag and he walks out and never comes back, whether he goes to the courtroom or not, there'll be some legal implications, but he left her. And that's what Jesus is talking about. That's what Jesus is saying. Whoever abandons his spouse, whoever seeks to permanently end the relationship, and whatever method or route or path he chooses to do that, whether he leaves or she leaves, or he tells her to leave or he tells her to leave, all of that aside, the basic meaning of divorce is to put away. We could define it this way. It's the opposite of what someone promised to do when they were joined together, when they were married. And so that's what Jesus is talking about. Whoever divorces his wife, whoever puts away his wife or his spouse. Next he says, for any reason except sexual immorality. And again, we'll just kind of have to guess, well, what was it like back then? We don't know what the uh, divorce percentages were, but out of all the people who would, would leave their spouse, how often would the, what percentage of time would the reason be, and your guess is as good as mine, what percentage of time would it be because of sexual immorality versus all of the other reasons why someone may leave their spouse? And then we could ask the same today. And I'm sure there's statistics somewhere for that. And my guess is, probably today, not so much different than then, that probably fewer people numerically leave because of sexual immorality than leave for the whole host of other categorical reasons for why they leave. And so my point here is that Jesus just carves out this small exception in the case of sexual immorality but his, he's generally saying, whoever divorces his wife for any reason, you could kind of put the exception in parentheses, but for any reason, he says, causes her to commit adultery. Now, that's a little bit unusual. Typically, when Jesus says, you know, you <laughs> sin starts in the heart, and you teach his doctrines, the commandments of men, those kind of things. But here he says, he causes her to sin. Can, can you call someone else to sin? I know at least one other occasion where Jesus said something like that. Whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, do you remember what Jesus said about that? The millstone goes around his neck. He's, he's better off if that had happened instead of him causing one of these little ones to stumble. That's in Matthew 18 and verse 6. So in that sense, yes, we can call someone. We can be significantly responsible for the sin of someone else. And notice that here Jesus even says that's true in the case of adultery, but you're not the one in bed with her. You can call someone to commit adultery and you're not there with her? That's what Jesus says. So how, how is that? Why is someone not with her causing her to commit adultery? And Jesus says it's when you've left her because by abandoning her, then she has to choose between living without a spouse, which... Most people are not going to choose to do. Or going and finding a spouse who they don't belong to because she still belongs to him. And so he has put her in that position. She's responsible for her choice. But he is the one forcing, forcing her to choose between the two. And when Jesus says that's adultery, it shows that by someone deciding to walk away, that didn't change anything about the relationship. It, it was adultery. They, they still belong to each other. And so when he or she went to someone else, it's adultery. Whether they went before or after whatever events occurred, it's, it's just adultery. And the only way you can abandon, leave, walk away from your spouse and not cause their adultery, he says, is if you do so for the cause of sexual immorality. And then even in this case, it isn't commanded. It's permitted. It's permitted. 
And then we'd look at other passages that tell us, so what, what about things that, aren't per, that are permitted, not commanded, not forbidden, just permitted? Well, what's, what's wise and unwise and, and good and what's better? Then it, we get into those kinds of situations. But then the end of verse 32, then the problem isn't over if he does that, because now someone else may be involved. Whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. See, now more people are involved. Now more lives are complicated. Uh, now faith and repentance becomes even more difficult in the lives of everybody that's involved. It, it, it may sometimes seem like it cannot guess, get worse, but in this case it, it can. And so how, how can all of this be avoided? This is like the Christmas slice that you pull out and it, they're tangled and knotted up uh, or the, the kite string or the fishing fishing string that's in the box and it's knotted and sometimes you just say I'd just rather start over throw it all out and just start from scratch except when it's human lives you can't do that and so how how do we avoid that the basic answer would be again in the beginning part of Matthew chapter 5 poor in spirit and mourn and meekness and hunger and thirst after righteousness look for it and desire it whatever God chooses to feed us with. And, and then going to, to the end of these series of, of teachings that Jesus gives in Matthew 7, 28 and 29. It says, And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at His teaching. For He taught them as one having authority and, and not as the scribes. I don't know all of what stood out in the minds of people that heard. Maybe again it was these statements that I say to you, I say to you, I say to you. I've been told that the Jewish leaders of that time, that they would quote uh, other Jewish leaders of the past. Well, Rabbi so-and-so said, well, but a different rabbi said this and another said something else. And if that be the case, then you can see here, Jesus sometimes read to them from the Old Testament, but most of His teaching was, was well, I say to you, and the people understood very easily uh, what his instruction was. And so the topic cannot be avoided if honoring God in our heart and soul and mind and strength is what our deepest desire is. So then let's go to Matthew chapter 19. For whatever reason, Matthew, uh, out of the four who wrote about Jesus' his life, Matthew gives us the most detail. The whole section is Matthew chapter 19 down through uh, 10 or, or verse 12. Uh, I'm not going to read the, the entire section, but here's an occasion like many where uh, the religious, some religious leaders come to Jesus and they ask Him a question. Remember, their purpose for asking a question was always, well, where, where can we try to trip Him up? Uh, maybe get Him to say something that we could use against Him. So that's the reason for their question in verse 3. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Uh, they, they did not want his help. Jesus, help us to understand what God wants us to do. That wasn't their purpose. But we can ask the same question uh, for, for a better reason. So verses 4 through 6 are, is the beginning of his answer. And it's interesting to see even the way Jesus starts in verse 4. He says, have you not read? Uh, he goes to talk about the beginning, which is found in that, that uh, difficult book to find, the book of Genesis. <laughs> Talking to the Pharisees. And he says, have you not read? That would be like a Supreme Court justice saying to one of the lawyers, um, have you not read that in the Constitution it says, well, I'm a lawyer, of course, that... That's kind of the effect of what he says to the religious leaders. Have you not read about there's this obscure couple named Adam and Eve and God created male and female? And then really his answer to their question is in verse 6. What God has joined together, let not man separate. That's the most basic answer. Well, then they say, well, but what about the law of Moses in verse 7? And Jesus answers a little bit about the law of Moses, but he gets to verse 9 and you notice verse 9 is a lot like Matthew 5, 32. I say unto you, that they wanted to talk about Moses. Jesus says, I say, unto you, I say to you, 
And then what we're going to read is basically the same thing that he said at the Sermon on the Mount. Whoever divorces his wife. And again, you've got the parentheses, the exception, except for sexual immorality. But in general, it's whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. Uh, Just with the exception for a moment, just apply that. What Jesus is implying is whoever divorces his wife for sexual immorality and marries another does not commit adultery. So God gives that permission in that circumstance for the one putting their spouse who was guilty of that away. But again, that's the exception. And that's whatever percentage of occasions that is. In general, Jesus is saying, you put them away, and there was no sexual immorality, you marry another and it's adultery, and then the spouse whom you've left, assuming there's no sexual immorality, they marry someone else, both of them are guilty of adultery. This, this is pretty, uh, pretty broad, pretty general, and, and pretty clear cut, covering the, the overwhelming majority of occasions. And then notice that there is no except at the end of verse 9. Whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So whether that one who was put away committed sexual immorality or did not, if there was no sexual immorality, if they marry another, then they're guilty of adultery. And then the last section that, uh, that would deal with this subject is 1 Corinthians 7. The whole section is verses 1 through 15. We're mostly just going to look at verses 10 through 15. The book of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 tells us that there was uh, uh, the household of Chloe who was telling Paul about some of the problems in Corinth, and so he's writing to address that. But also, when we, we read the book of Corinthians, we find out that they had written a letter to Paul. Maybe it was also Chloe's household, I don't know. But they had some questions And so in verse 1, concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So he says, I think he says that on more than than one occasion. And so that's why Paul deals with the subject here. And so let's read verses 10 through 15. I'll just read it all together and then we'll go back over it. As I read, let's see, does, does Paul say anything different than what Jesus has already said? Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord... A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. But to the rest I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. In other words, their, their marriage is legitimate. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they're holy, meaning it's a holy relationship. But if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Notice verses 10 and 12. If you compare the beginning of those, that's some of the most difficult parts of this section where Paul says, to the the married I command in verse 10. And then in verse 12 he says, to the rest. And then in verse 10, going back, he says, uh, yet not I, but the Lord. And then in verse 12 he says, I, not the Lord. Those are some of the more difficult parts, at least for me in this section. And so that can raise some different legitimate questions. But really in the end, uh, Paul ends up saying the same thing regardless of who he's he's saying spoke or in regards to who is being spoken to. In either case, do you see that he says in verses 10 and 11, a wife is not to depart from her husband and a husband is not to depart from his wife. And then if you go down to verses 12 and 13, he says the same thing. Let him not divorce her. Let her not divorce him. Again, we we noted the exception in what Jesus gave, and Paul's not overriding or or ignoring that. Uh, 
Uh, he's, you know, he's just giving the basic law, and, and that's what it is. Now, let's go back and, and spend a, a moment in verse 11, where Paul says, Well, but if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. It, Paul here is not contradicting what he just said. He's not saying, well, don't divorce your spouse. But, I mean, if things aren't going well, it's okay. And then just don't marry someone else or later be reconciled. He's not giving a circumstance in which it's okay to do what he just said, do not do. He's not contradicting his words, nor is he contradicting. Let's keep in the, the foreground or the background what we've already seen that the Lord said in Matthew 5 and in Matthew 19. So he says, a wife is not to depart from her husband. If I do depart, what we've seen is that's a sin. Matthew chapter 5. If I do depart and then she marries someone else, then, then I'm implicated in that. But it's possible that some had already departed or that even later that some would depart. And then once they, once they cross that line, then the question has to be asked, okay, well, what, what do I do now? And so he deals with that. And of course, what do I do now? Well, if I've departed, when God said not to depart, I, I have to ask forgiveness. Uh, maybe that's the most obvious thing. But then as far as visible terms in that relationship, maybe I started the problem. So now what? And so Paul's instructions here would apply in that circumstance. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I left my spouse and I shouldn't have. Now, I recognize that that was wrong. Well, remain unmarried. Maybe you can't talk them into coming back. You, as we say, you burn that bridge, and they, they won't agree to be reconciled. And so he says in that case, you remain unmarried. Or, in whatever case, if you can be reconciled, I think it would be pretty obvious that that would be the, uh, the ideal and the most desirable to God and, and for all, all involved. But... Uh, but Paul describes in verses 10 and 11 what could happen. But again, that doesn't contradict uh, the more general statement and pretty basic statement that he, Paul has made and that Jesus made in both uh, of the cases that Matthew recorded. And then down in verse 15, here maybe is one of the most unique statements in this chapter on the subject where he says, If the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. While this is some, ununique, uh, this is some unique wording, it doesn't change anything. Uh, it only comments on what the unbeliever might do, because he doesn't have any regard or concern for what Jesus said or what Paul said as an apostle. He doesn't care. So here's what might happen. So then he says, well, here's what the unbeliever can do. You, you can't go handcuff yourself to your spouse who is determined to leave. You're not in bondage. You can't grab onto their coattails and keep them here or drag them, let them just drag you along wherever they go. If they desire to depart, what can you do about it? He says, you let them depart. You don't be the one departing. You don't be the one pushing them out the door. He's already said that in many words in verses 12 and 13. But if they go, you didn't make them go. You, you can't stop them from going if they depart. Uh, and while the wording is unique, it doesn't teach anything else than what has already been taught. And in fact, two Christians who are married to each other, they're not under bondage. And if for some reason one decides to depart, the other one, you could say the, exactly the same thing. They're not under bondage. God has called us to peace. That, that's equally true of two Christians who are married as well. And so notice that neither in this verse or anywhere up to this point in the chapter, Paul doesn't say anything about remarriage. He talks about that later in this chapter when he talks about widows. Widows, of course, could remarry. But he doesn't say anything about remarriage. Uh, presumably, the Corinthians didn't ask about remarriage. Remember, he's answering questions. And he doesn't say anything here about marrying someone else. I would assume that means they didn't ask about it. And maybe they didn't ask because maybe either they had the, the Gospel of Matthew or if Matthew hadn't written it yet, if it hadn't been distributed yet, then the Holy Spirit was guiding the apostles to teach exactly what Jesus taught. 
And so maybe they had heard enough from Paul or from some prophet or from some, in, some evangelist uh, that to know about remarriage. And so they maybe didn't ask. But for whatever, for whatever reason, Paul doesn't say anything in this section uh, that would, would alter or change at all what we read that Jesus said in regards to divorce or remarriage. Last, just want to give a couple of applications. Uh, hopefully this lesson will not specifically apply to any of us and reading these things and being reminded of these principles, I hope can help in that. But one reason that we need one reason that we need to be reminded of these things is because we're not reminded of these things pretty much anywhere else in our society. And I find myself noticing that in subject after subject uh, today. I, I wasn't raised having prayer in school. Uh, I don't know if any, anyone here was. But there are many things that uh, there's certainly evil being pushed, but there's also things that just are being removed. And then there's nothing in, put into its place that can serve the same role. And so neither we nor our children are hearing anything like what we've read from Jesus and from, from Paul tonight, uh, from what's being taught, taught in, in public schools or private schools. There's nothing like what I've talked about tonight or in the other lesson on marriage that is being taught or reinforced in media and arts and shows and in songs little if anything i don't expect to turn on the radio or and hear a public service announcement from the ad council uh, here's here's what is important for the stability of families uh, if a husband has a wife don't don't bring that into the american courts typical there may be some exceptions to this but typical pre-marriage and marriage counseling from those educated at american institutions they're not going to be saying the kinds of things that we've read we know that American law and American culture is not advising or promoting these things. And so, where are we going to hear it from if we don't read it from Scripture? And I don't mean depending on me. I mean as we read God's Word, if we don't get it there, we're not going to be getting it. And at best, we would just hear nothing, I suppose. I guess out of the options are you hear what's wrong, you hear nothing, or you hear what's right. Those are... Hearing what's wrong and hearing nothing are, are dangerous in different ways. But what we are hearing is ideas that contradict this. And this lesson sitting alongside the other lesson. I was reminded of this. I don't know how many of you heard of this locally. Uh, on, on October 19th, the Fairbanks School District asked school board members to green light, push through curriculum supplements, that teach students as young as age 12 how to have sex or stimulate their partners while also giving them advice on how to select appropriate contraceptives, including the morning after pill, which can cause early abortions. I'm trying to read that as quickly as I can for the sake of younger ones. One sex ed video emphasizes that students have the right to use contraception without informing their parents. Conservative school board member April Smith was far more direct, saying the proposed curriculum has caused public humiliation. She said, quote, a lack of trust in the district with a number of people. I think it's humiliating to us as an organization that we even put it out there on our website that we'd like to show this to your children. Uh, no, that's not directly related to divorce and remarriage, but you get the point. If, if that's what they're wanting to show, and from what I read, this additional curriculum was, was wanted by some teachers and so the, uh, the district approved it. My understanding is the school board did not agree to it. And so I guess that's an ongoing saga. But that, that tells you what, what is out there. And if, if your children are in the schools, there are ways that you can help them not, not see that, I suppose. Uh, but my point is that whether our children, and I trust our children will not see that, but who will see it? The kids they play ball with? Uh, the, the ones they're in some club with, or the ones later they go to college with, or that they're in some job training with, or that they're working with, or that they're working under, or that they're supervising, 
Or if they go out and they, they're meeting people and, and dating people who saw that, that, that's what our society is being fed. Again, we can shield ourselves and our children to some degree, but not from the people who, who are seeing this and who over time are going to view what was described there as normal, where, whether it gets passed in this particular school district. Uh, we, we all see the direction the train is going. Just one other example. A year or two ago, while watching a child, a child show with our children, a show called Pete the Cat, we noticed one of Pete's friends had parents, both of whom were male. So we didn't finish the show with the children. And it's, it's just, just a reminder, uh, the things that we have looked at tonight, we're, we're not hearing that from our society, but we and our children and our grandchildren, they're, they're getting fed something. And while we want to shield them from that, we also have to feed them on what God feeds us with. And then last, well, this is, again, one of the more unpleasant aspects of what God has said. Uh, we have to teach and train ourselves to view God's warnings and to view God's restrictions like we do a warning sign that gets our attention. It'd be nice if we were just driving only on roads that are always just straight and wide and we don't need any warning signs. The avalanche is always going to be so far away from the road, we don't need a warning sign about an avalanche. But that's not reality. So the warning signs get our attention and they bring some unpleasant thoughts and possibilities to our mind. But warning signs are there for our benefit. Uh, you're glad a guardrail is there for the purpose that it serves. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, his, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. They are expressions of God's love and God's wisdom. And when Satan tempts us to think otherwise, all he's doing is trying to pull the same job on us that he did with Eve. Oh, has God said? Well, God knows your circumstance. It, it, it will be okay. Uh, trying to pull the same deceit over our eyes that he did Israel. What God, in, in what way have you loved us? How can you say you love us when you have these kind of narrow, strict instructions how can you say you love us how have we profited by serving you we're we're just being fooled the same way and our society is as eve was as israel was and we we are without the help of the spirit as we looked at this morning we'll be deceived as well ecclesiastes teaches us there will be problems life will be difficult but it could be worse and it will be worse if we do what? If we don't honor God. It will be worse. Sin always makes it worse. And so help yourself and help your spouse and help your children and help your community honor God. Honor God. His commandments are not burdensome. Sin is. As we sing this invitation song number 347, God's commandments are not burdensome. Sin is. And yet, no doubt, that was the appeal of, of Jesus. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, all of you who have found out about the burden of going the other direction, I will give you rest. If there's any here tonight who need to confess their faith that Jesus is the Christ, who need, because of that faith, to be baptized so that His death will wash away your sins. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Or if as a Christian you need to turn to Him uh, again, you, you made a promise to Him and He kept His promise to you and was faithful to you, if you need to return to Him, and we can help you, come and tell us how as we sing.